Mia was half lounging in a comfortable chair in the corner of the dressing room. Her friend and colleague Olivia sat on the armrest. Across from her on a swivel chair sat Eva. She was telling the girls a story about an obsessive admirer who every morning meets her at the entrance with a bouquet of flowers. So serious. Eva was having fun. His eyes are sad, but in them there is so much hope. Sometimes he doesn't say a word. Sometimes he declares his love. And I'm so proud, passing by. Aren't you scared? Olivia asked. Where do you live? Every day you are followed by a crazy person? Her friend's assumption made Eve laugh. He's just a wimp. He's here now, on the dance floor, waiting for us to come out. Still, I'd be careful. He's weird. Vigilant. Olivia shook her head. Come on, Eva grinned. He's funny. All the girls were dressed in short shorts and rhinestone tops. Their long hair was loose and they wore eye-catching makeup on their faces. The girls worked as dancers at a local club, performing to warm up the audience on high platforms above the dance floor. Calypso's guests received the three beauties to the hilt, especially the male part of the club's visitors. How Mia ended up here? All simply came to the casting, having seen an announcement at the bus stop, required dancers in the evening show. The girl naively at first thought that it was about something like a concert hall. She knew how to dance, she knew how to dance, and she loved it. Her childhood was spent in a large village with a beautiful name, Yasnoi. On the central square, there was a two-story children's art center. It was in this center that Mia, for as long as she could remember, was engaged in choreography. At first, her mother and grandmother took turns taking her to classes. Then Mia grew up and got there on her own. Gradually, she joined the dance group. The girls performed at all the festivals in Yasnoya and even traveled to the city for competitions. They often came back as winners, bringing cups, medals, and certificates to Yasnoy. Friendship, adventures, rehearsals, performances. It was a bright, rich life. Mia adored dancing and did not see herself as anything but a professional dancer, until she realized that her abilities, although certainly not bad, but very far from perfection, at major regional and district competitions, Mia saw girls of her age who could do things that she herself had never dreamed of. And her mother was against such a career. She tuned her daughter to get a serious profession. Well, to become an engineer or a lawyer, you probably do not have enough brains, Mom argued with offensive directness. But there are other options. I was looking for a food technologist to study or a marketer, for example. Mom was right. Mia's school grades left much to be desired. Years of choreography, but the rest. The girl didn't have a taste for science. She liked to dance in her dance group. She was one of the best, but still not good enough to compete with young dancers in regional competitions. What to speak of a higher level. When the time came, her mother and stepfather decided everything for Mia, paid for her commercial training at the Faculty of Technology of Food Production. They rented an apartment for the girl not far from the university and sent her away from home with a light heart. Mia knew that everyone was happy to see her go because ever since her mother had married Oliver, Mia had felt superfluous all the time. It was as if she was getting in the way of their enjoyment of each other, distracting them with her learning problems and sometimes behavior at school. When Mia was nine, Alice, her baby sister, was born. Immediately it turned out that reserved and cold Oliver can be a wonderful father tender caring, attentive. The mother, too, had melted into the little girl. Mia watched them coo over little Alice and her heart ached because all she got were remarks, heavy sighs, irritation. No, her mom and stepdad were kind of trying for Mia. They really did a lot for her future, hired tutors, bought beautiful clothes and goodies, planned the future of the eldest daughter. But it's all kind of on the job, just because they have to. Mother and Oliver's hearts belong to little Alice, her smile immediately caused their delight and enthusiasm of conversations in the house was only that about new skills and amazing abilities of the little girl. As the years went by, Alice grew up. Nothing changed. She was just some perfect child, obeyed her parents, loved to read, tried to help her mom and dad in everything. And when Alice went to school, it turned out that she was also smart. The girl brought home only A's, exceptionally. Mia loved her little sister too. Alice really was a wonderful person, sensitive, kind, and funny. But it was hard to feel like an extra in your own home. And that's exactly how Mia felt. 
Dancing was the only salvation of the girl on the stage in the circle of her favorite friends Mia forgot all her sorrows. Music and clear movements invariably lifted her spirits. The applause of the grateful audience was encouraging. Except that one day the children's center was bought by a businessman, and the club turned into a dairy. New jobs appeared in Yasnoi, by the way, well paid. Some sections and clubs moved to local schools. But Mia's dance group broke up. They needed large halls, mirrors, a stage. Mia felt this moment hard. The one thing that filled her life with energy and joy was gone. No more rehearsals, no more walks with the girls after practice, no more road shows. All for the best, her mother exhorted her. She couldn't understand her eldest daughter, and she didn't try to. Probably, you are already in the final year of high school will soon enter. It's not the same century to be engaged in frivolous dances. It's time to start studying. Whatever works out for the best. Oliver's always been on his mother's side. We'll pay for you to go to a commercial food processing program. Your job is to make C's so you don't drop out. When you come back to the dairy, you'll get our job. That's how it is. Her parents had already decided everything for Mia. She didn't fight back because she didn't have any dreams to fight for. Her plans to become a great dancer were in the past. Mia felt that she was interfering with her stepfather and mother, that without her their family mom, dad and little miracle daughter would become more harmonious and happy. So when the time came, the girl happily flew out of the nest. A new life, new acquaintances, bright impressions were waiting for her. Stepfather twice a month transferred to Mia's card money, which was enough only for groceries. But the girl could not complain. She realized that her parents are not millionaires to provide her with a trouble-free life. They already had to pay for school and rent. But in the city, in the city was so many interesting movies, cafes, stores with beautiful clothes, nightclubs, all these pleasures cost not cheap. And Mia, of course, could not afford much. She needed money. Studying did not take much time and effort. Her mother was right. At the commercial department of a not too prestigious faculty, students were not required to do anything supernatural. The main thing was not to miss lecturers and attend all seminars. That's why Mia gradually formed in her head a clear idea that she needed a job. Yes, she could study and work part-time in the evenings. Waitress, saleswoman, animator, food delivery person. There were plenty of jobs for students in the big city. The girl methodically wrote them out in a notebook. She ended up with an impressive list. One of these would be a good fit. That's the ad. An ad recruiting girls for a dance show. It came across by accident. Fate, no less. Of course, Mia couldn't ignore it. The girl immediately dialed the number indicated in the ad. She was listened to and invited to the casting, with her heart pounding with excitement. Mia arrived at the appointed time at Club Calypso. It was three o'clock in the afternoon. The deserted dance floor looked huge. Mia was even confused at first. A scowling security guard escorted her to the dressing room. There, the girl was given a strange costume. It looked more like a swimsuit than a dance outfit. A silver skirt that looked like a wide belt, a tiny top. The girl who gave away the costume by the young dancer's surprised face realized everything. So you don't know where you've come either? She inquired. I told you that the announcement should be made correctly. You are already so fifth that you will leave now. Too bad you have the right data. Ah, and what is the job anyway? Mia decided to find out. It turned out that they needed girls for club dancing, slender young ladies who can move beautifully. When the degree of fun drops on the dance floor, the girls are released on a high platform, and they add energy and mood to the evening. Will I be wearing clothes? Mia asked. The girl laughed. Of course, it's a decent place after all. Yes, the dancers' costumes are revealing enough to attract attention, but it's just dancing. And we have good security here. They make sure there are no misunderstandings. Mia thought about it and agreed to give it a try. After all, it was her long-forgotten dream to dance in front of an audience. Besides, the salary offered was more than good. You can't earn so much as a waitress. And the Club Calypso really is a serious place. In the last resort, if you don't like something, you can always leave. That's how Mia became a dancer. Two other girls joined her at Calypso. At first, the choreographer showed the newcomers the basic movements Olivia, Eva, and Mia quickly realized what was required of them. The choreographer was pleased. Nothing complicated, smiled the man. 
a rather famous dancer in the past. I showed you the bass and then improvise, move to the music, show yourself. You are beautiful, graceful, just nymphs. The audience will love you. At first, Mia was shy to go under the spotlight. She realized that everyone was looking at her, looking at her. But then, looking at the self-consciously dancing friends girl was drawn in, relaxed. Now she felt on her platform, like a fish in water. Are they watching? Well, that's fine. They admire her, and there is something to admire. Slender, trim figure, long legs, shiny dark hair, beautifully flowing down her elegant shoulders, huge eyes, black eyebrows, plump, almost like Angelina Jolie, lips. And when she was a child, Mia had been embarrassed by them. Some of her classmates had even teased her about her lips being a spanky fish. Now these girls themselves ran to cosmetology to inject fillers. Time passed, and Mia began to enjoy her work. She liked to delight. During the dance, she felt like a queen, elevated above the crowd, because the platform girls were high enough so that they could not get them obsessive fans. And the young nymphs certainly had admirers. The security of the girls was strictly monitored by two strong, pumped-up guys. The institution is still a serious nightclub. Calypso is not a cheap eatery and not a third-rate bar. But incidents still happened. Some guests of the club managed to achieve their goal to get to the girl they liked. That's what happened to Eva. A young guy who got into the club by chance one day saw her and apparently fell in love. He followed the girl when she returned home in the morning and got her address. So now he meets her every morning with flowers. Eva's laughing. Mia, on the other hand, would be wary. I don't know what this guy has in mind. And how did he track Eva down? The club's employees were leaving the club in the morning through a different building entirely. The one next door. That's surprising. Maybe he bribed one of the guards. Still, Mia felt a little sorry for the guy. He must have had Eva in his heart if he'd neglected all his work and was waiting for her at the entrance. And flowers aren't cheap these days. Maybe he's spending his last dime on a bouquet, but Eva? Everything's funny to her. Mia also had an admirer who knew more about her than he should. And he, he didn't look like the poor, humble guy who'd been giving Eva a hard time. He was a grown man, mature and very wealthy. William owned a chain of high-end restaurants in their town. He was in his late forties, tall, athletic, trim, well-groomed, always stylishly and tastefully dressed, incredibly charismatic and charming. Eva and Olivia were even a little jealous of Mia because William paid attention to her. Usually the guards stopped the girls from talking to the guests of the club, but this time the owner of the club approached Mia and, a little stammering, offered to meet with her. One of our VIP guests really liked you. He wants to hang out with you just to talk. If you don't mind me saying so, he'll understand. It's just that this is a powerful man and... Mia realized it was something very serious. The owner of the club was almost making excuses for her. She felt a little scared. And at the same time, she was curious as to what kind of important figure was paying attention to her. Who was he? This person who made the master embarrassed in front of her as an ordinary dancer. And it flattered Mia's ego. That's how irresistible she is, since she's attracted such a man. Anyway, Mia agreed to the meeting, which made her boss happy. William came straight to her dressing room. So handsome. So strong. He was not distinguished by muscles and pumped up torso, but nevertheless, gave the impression of a very strong and confident man. The man looked at Mia with interest, who had already changed her dancing costume for blue ripped jeans and a stretchy t-shirt, William had mesmerized her. Could this man really be her admirer? Until now, the guards had kept the boys away from her. Who had a crush on the pretty dancer? Suddenly she's got a man like this. William sat in the chair across from Mia and smiled at her. He seemed amused by the girl's confusion. Why are you so stiff? Finally, he broke the silence. You looked very different on stage. Mia smiled embarrassedly and quite childishly dulled her eyes, she could not understand her feelings. This man was both frightening and attractive at the same time. William took the initiative, he mastered the art of negotiation, and Mia didn't even notice how relaxed she was. The man asked the girl about her life and hobbies, so she wanted to tell him everything. He listened attentively and made appropriate remarks. Once in a while, Mia also dared to ask him questions. He answered straightforwardly, not evasively. 
So Mia learned that William was the owner of a restaurant business and consequently a very rich man. He also had a wife and children. The man did not even try to hide it, as well as the fact that he liked Mia very much. He offered her to be with him together to travel, to spend time, to communicate. You are very beautiful, William said, looking straight into her eyes. These words from his lips had an incredible effect on the girl. Goosebumps ran down her back, her palms became cold, and blood rushed to her cheeks. I would really like to get to know you better, but I see that you are not ready yet. Am I right? Of course he was right. William seemed to know everything in the world. Mia nodded cautiously. Well, I won't rush you, William smiled. But no one can stop me from coming and admiring you. You don't mind, do you? Of course Mia didn't mind. She realized that from now on she would dance just for him, and she would look for William with her eyes among the crowd. He intimidated her with his power and importance and attracted her. His eyes, his voice with a slight huskiness. The scent of high-end perfume mixed with the smell of expensive cigarettes. It all made the girl's head spin, but something kept Mia from taking a counter step. She needed to think it over. William is married. He offers her to be his mistress. It's not an enviable role. After all, Mia was raised in a traditional family, and all her neighbors were the same. Such liaisons were strongly discouraged in their neighborhood. It was scary to be in the hands of such a powerful man. Now, for now, the final step has not yet been taken. William is keeping his distance, giving her a choice. Will Mia have a choice later? That's the question. William is gone. Mia's time of anguish and torment began for her. At night, lying in her bed, she imagined William, trying to figure out where he was, what he was doing. Maybe seducing another young beauty or working. Was he thinking of her? Or was her indecision the end of a relationship that had never really begun? The next day, Mia had a day off. She didn't go to the club. But on Saturday, the girl performed. Mia danced on her platform and desperately hoped that William could see her now. She was trying for him, just for him. And William saw her. Back in the dressing room, Mia found a bouquet of scarlet roses on her dressing table with a note from him. The man expressed his admiration for the young dancer and compared her to a lovely, graceful nymph. That would make anyone dizzy. William often came to the club when Mia noticed him in the VIP zone her heart began to beat more often. The man sent her gifts like a bouquet of flowers, a bottle of expensive wine or a dainty bracelet. Sometimes he showed up himself. Mia always waited for these meetings. He sat in the dressing room in the chair opposite the girl. They would talk. William looked at Mia with interest. His eyes were filled with admiration and passion. William waited patiently for a sign from the girl, and this attracted Mia even more. But she was still hesitant. Her friends called her a fool for that. Such a man dreamily shook her head, Eva. Not like my beggar admirer with bouquets. If I were you, I wouldn't hesitate for a second, Olivia said. I wish I was that lucky. Try harder. Maybe you'll make it. Eve teased her friend. No. The same poor students are falling for me as for you. Olivia was not indebted. Mia hesitated. Something kept her from becoming a mistress. William still has a wife and he's pursuing her with a young dancer. It says a lot about a man's moral fiber and his lack of seriousness about her. However, all this became unimportant when William sat down in the chair opposite Mia and looked at her with his deep dark eyes, mesmerizing like a boa constrictor to a rabbit. Mia realized that she was just a beautiful trophy to him. William would quickly play with her and find himself a new object, and she was just a difficult prey to heat up the hunting excitement. Yes, Mia realized all that, and at the same time, she realized she couldn't resist for long. William had an almost magical effect on her. Mia found it increasingly difficult to control herself. His look, his voice, his palms, his lips. The girl had no strength left to resist. Good for you, that you're holding on somehow, praised Mia Costumer, a woman in her forties. The only thing you have to do is to go along with Vilia, and all is lost. I've seen a lot of them. First one, then another, then a third. But you're a good girl. You've got guts, with a backbone. If that woman knew what kind of dreams Mia was having with William. But the costume maker's words gave the girl confidence for a while that her detached behavior was the best strategy of behavior in this situation. The parents didn't know what their daughter did for a living. 
Mia didn't tell them she danced. They wouldn't have understood, would have thought their daughter was dishonoring their devout family. They'd have taken her back to the village for good. Once again, Mia would have to feel like the fifth wheel on the cart. And of course, her mother and stepfather knew nothing about William or Mia's new lifestyle. They preferred to keep their distance. The three of them seemed to live well together. Time passed. Gradually, Mia began to realize that she was losing herself. At first, the dancing, the club, the nightlife, the admirers, all seemed like a colorful adventure. But then, then the girl began to feel some kind of strange desolation rumbling music, cigarette smoke, booze flowing in rivers, sticky stairs, flashing lights, and William. William, who was getting more and more insistent and assertive. Mia's partners changed one by one. First, Olivia's parents found out about who their daughter worked for, showed up at her door and made her scandalized and forced her to quit. Then Eva Eva unexpectedly married that funny fan with flowers. He turned out to be reliable, faithful and genuinely in love. Eva appreciated all of this at face value. The girls were quickly replaced. The new girls danced no worse, but Mia could not make friends with them. Maybe she just didn't want to. Now the girl drank a lot and somehow she became addicted to the energy cocktails that were served in the Calypso bar. They gave her strength, lifted her mood, and made her gloomy thoughts disappear. Everything seemed to be fine with Mia, she danced and earned money with it, and not bad. At the same time studied at the university. She even had a wealthy admirer. Mia knew that if she asked, William would do anything for her. For this man it seems that nothing is impossible at all. True. Any request has its price, but it is not so important. And yet there was still a kind of hopeless longing in Mia's soul. She wanted to be like before, full of hope for a new interesting life, modest, a little shy. But after more than a year of dancing in front of hundreds of people, it is difficult to return to the past, to the present. One day Mia decided to quit. She went to the owner of Calypso with her application, but he offered her twice the salary because Mia was so well received by the public. So she stayed. It's true what they say, everything has its price, even Mia. That evening, the girl was returning home from university. Tomorrow is the exam. There was a counseling session today. Mia's not ready, but that's okay. She already has an envelope on her shelf with the required amount. Working at Calypso allows her not to waste time on unnecessary studies. Her parents, looking at her daughter's credit card, rejoiced. They thought Mia had finally gotten smart. They did not assume that 70% of these marks the girl simply bought. It was hard to deceive them. Yes, Mia didn't have a close relationship with her mother. Still, she had too much to hide from her. And then there was William. He offered Mia a vacation to the Dominican Republic, a paradise, a luxury resort, a week alone with William, away from all the worries and heavy thoughts. It's a reboot. Mia needed it. She didn't have the strength to resist William, and she didn't want to. What did she have to lose? So, lying to everyone. So why not make the most of this situation? And what happens next? Who cares? The girl was distracted from her gloomy thoughts by a startled shriek. The weak, trembling voice was full of despair. Mia turned around at the sound and was stunned. An old woman, thin, small, with a plaid bag in her hands, was huddled against the wall of the house. Her eyes were full of horror because a huge dog was coming straight at her and growled threateningly. It was a hungry stray animal with a pile of hair on its heavy set flanks. The dog must have smelled the meat the old woman was carrying home from the market. As luck would have it, no one was around. The big dog, smelling a weak victim, was preparing to attack. Mia, without thinking, grabbed the stick that spilled out at her feet. She shouted loudly at the beast and went straight at him. The dog was confused. He felt the strength and determination of his opponent. In addition, he was very embarrassed by the stick. Deciding not to mess with people, the beast ran away. The old woman, pale as a sheet, followed the dog with a look. She could not believe her unexpected rescue. Mia came closer to her. Are you all right? I'm fine, honey, I'm fine. Thank you so much. I thought he was going to bite me. How did you not freak out? How did you decide to save me? Mia shrugged. In the village, she had often seen people fending off dogs. It was usually enough to hold something in their hands and show their confidence. Dogs are afraid of that. Such a pretty girl, thin, young, and not afraid. The old lady continued to marvel. 
and they also say that man is the stronger sex. Mia smiled. She was pleased with the gratitude of this old lady. Next to her, she felt strong, good and kind. It was a wonderful feeling. I want to thank you, the stranger continued. But that's not necessary, the girl protested. It wasn't hard for me. In fact, anyone would have done that in my place, but not anyone. The old woman shook her head. You have a heart of gold. I still want to thank you. I have something. This thing is as if it was specially made for you, and I especially don't need it. Mia's curiosity got the better of her. I wonder what she's talking about. What is this thing? Let's go. The old woman smiled, noticing the hesitation of her interlocutor. I live nearby, in the next house. Mia did not follow the old woman into the apartment. It's not a big deal. There are so many stories about the disappearance of young girls. Still, she could not trust a stranger 100%. The old woman understood everything and was not offended. On the contrary, she praised her companion for her vigilance. The old woman was gone for about five minutes, and then she came out to Mia with a small package in her hands. The thing this grandmother was talking about was carefully wrapped in wrapping paper. Here you go, she smiled, holding out the gift to Mia. This, it's as if it was specially made for you. Amazing, it's not even like this. The girl impatiently untied the string, unwrapped the paper and couldn't hold back a surprised sigh. How could such a thing be possible? It was a painting, painted in colors, small, a little larger than a standard photograph, and yet all the details on it were written out amazingly accurately and clearly. Mia gazed into this creation, growing more and more amazed, because the painting was a picture of herself, while working at the club, by the looks of it. One of her arms is up in the air, her back slightly thrown back, long hair swept back over her shoulders. Only instead of the usual mini shorts and skirt, the artist drew on her an exquisite light dress on thin straps, as if shining from within, like a princess from a fairy tale. A thin tiara completed the image. Mia recognized herself. It was her face, her eyes, her eyebrows, her lips. Her bracelet on her arm was leather, wide, made up of a tangle of thin straps. She bought it in a gift shop once. Inexpensive, but a favorite piece of jewelry. Darkness reigned around the heroine of the painting, which was slightly dispersed by the light of the stars. She looks like you, smiled the old woman. That's why I decided to give it to you. This princess is one of my favorite paintings, but it suits you better by God. Where did you get this? Mia's finally regained her speech. Jack gave it to me. The artist rented my apartment for a long time. And now? He's been gone for a couple months now, but he comes to visit me sometimes. I used to treat him like my own grandson. I don't have any of my own. And Jack, he's not used to that kind of care. His family is strict, cold, so he melted. He got attached to me. He painted so many pictures for me, landscapes, still lifes, and even my portrait. And the princess. This one, he often paints her. She's dancing or just sitting on the shore or smiling. It's beautifully drawn, very beautiful. He's a talent and he's appreciated. Why did he leave me? He got some money so he bought an apartment in the center, with a picturesque view of the river. She's a princess or a mermaid or a nymph or just an ordinary girl. How many times have I asked who that is? I thought maybe it was his favorite girl. And he jokes off, he says I saw her in a dream, that's all. You can't get another word out of him. Amazing story. It sure is. And you? You look a lot like this girl. It's practically a portrait of you. That's why I'm giving you this painting. Mia smiled, thanked the old woman and went home. She spent the rest of the evening admiring the painting, more and more convinced that it depicted her, and the facial features, and the figure, and even the movement in which the girl froze. Everything matched, except for the costume, of course. Mia had never worn such beautiful long dresses and tiaras, but everything else was one and the same. There was no doubt about it. That mysterious artist, Jack, that's what the old lady had called him. He must have seen her at the club. During a dance, probably the movements from her dance the painter had depicted in his painting. And it just so happens that the work ended up in her hands by accident. It's mystical. Looking at the portrait, Mia tried to imagine its creator. She knew it was a fairly young man. The old lady had said she treated him like a grandson. So Jack is about Mia's age or slightly older. 
and he's also undoubtedly a very talented guy. How accurately he captured Mia's movement, and the details. The artist even remembered to label the tiny mole on her shoulder. Jack probably saw it more than once. Maybe he even went to the club on purpose to get a better look at the dancer. It seems she seriously hooked him. According to the old woman, Jack often made the girl the heroine of his paintings. Mia wondered. Apparently, she had other devoted admirers besides William, but Jack never showed himself in any way. He remained invisible to Mia. Mia thought about William. Dominicana. A trustworthy, strong man by her side. A wonderful week ahead. But then what? He would go back to his wife and children, and she would remain in the status of mistress. They'll see each other occasionally. William will not, of course, begrudge her attention and gifts. Mia will have luxury, expensive things. Maybe he'll even buy her a car and an apartment. But that's not certain, of course. And then William would quickly become satiated. Mia knew that. The girl understood perfectly well that it was her aloofness and inaccessibility that caught the man's eye. What about her? Did she love William herself? Mia had some feelings for the man, that was for sure. He drew her in with his strength and confidence, determined and successful, almost omnipotent, and he looks at her, an ordinary student, a dancer, a girl from the village, as if she were a deity. It's not a fact that this look is sincere. William is experienced, mature, intelligent, he knows how to act to get his way. And yet, realizing all this, Mia is still drawn to William. It's a strange, confusing situation. Mia wanted love, warmth, care. She didn't get all that at home, and in William's strong, reliable arms, she would feel needed and protected for a while, and even, perhaps, could convince herself that it was not an illusion. And then, it was this later that made the girl hesitate and doubt. William would leave her, return to his family, find a new object of passion on the side. Would Mia be able to cope with his departure? Will she be able to take it? Suddenly, this picture is like a message from a secret admirer from Jack. Mia really seems to have aroused strong feelings in him. He portrayed her as more than just beautiful, like a half-goddess. Only someone truly in love could look at her like that. It's a shame Jack's been left in the shadows. He may have tried to get to her, but the guards wouldn't let him. Not everyone is as powerful as William. Mia was suddenly very eager to get to know him, this artist for whom she'd become a muse, to see what he looked like, to hear the young man's voice, to talk to him, and look into his eyes. Only how to find Jack in this huge city. The old lady said the artist had managed to buy himself an apartment in the center overlooking the river. Mia knew nothing more about him, only his name and approximate place of residence. That's a bit small, isn't it? I wish I knew Jack's last name. Then it would be possible to scour social networks or artist forums. But as it is, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Of course, we could go back to the old lady, ask her more about the young man. Maybe she knows his address, but it's awkward. Anyway, well, they'll see each other. And then what? She'll think the guy's in love and maybe he's not free at all. Mia's thoughts were interrupted by a phone call. William. They agreed to call tonight. A man to explain how to apply for a passport. A trip to the paradise corner of the earth was just around the corner. William became more persistent. He now came to Mia's dressing room more often, sat closer, and even allowed himself to hug the girl around the waist, which had not happened before. More and more often, Mia felt like William's thing. In a way, it was even pleasant. Next to him, she didn't have to decide anything, only obey his orders. But on the other hand, such an attitude was overwhelming, but Mia, she could no longer push him away, refuse him. They were going on a trip, and there was already a special relationship between them. Just a little bit more, and they would become quite serious. Mia's heart was heavy. She felt that by getting closer to William, she was making a mistake. This communication would change her, change her irrevocably. Drinking was a good way to drown out the sad thoughts. There was more and more of it in Mia's life. A glass of wine before bed. Weekends at the bar with a beer. This trend was starting to stress Mia out. On the other hand, everyone around her was acting the same way. And nothing, sort of. It was just a normal summer evening. Mia was sitting at home watching TV, eating ice cream. Basically, relaxing. Today was her day off. She didn't need to go to Calypso. 
Some acquaintances had invited her to a bar, but Mia had declined. She wanted to be alone in silence and tranquility. Loud music and the hum of people's voices was enough for her at work. And suddenly, it was as if some unknown force lifted her off the couch and forced her to pull on shorts and a t-shirt. She's going downtown. Yes, a great idea to walk alone along the waterfront. She'd look at the houses, one of which appeared to be where the very same Jack lived. The painting now had a place of honor in the apartment, standing on Mia's bedside table. Every time she woke up, she saw herself in the image of a beautiful princess and smiled. She felt warm and light at heart. Someone sees her with such eyes, it means that she is not indifferent to this someone. Despite the weekday evening, the center was crowded. Parents with small children, couples in love, teenagers on scooters strolled along the embankment. There was always a festive atmosphere here. Mia walked along the promenade. To her right was a parapet, behind which flowed a full-flowing river. On the other bank was a huge park, overgrown with tall trees. Pleasure boats with vacationers sailed along the river. On the left side of the street towered five-story houses. They were brand new, recently built, but not typical high-rise buildings in the form of stone boxes, but buildings with fanciful balconies, galleries, and passages. Mia knew they were high-end housing. It looked like Jack was really starting to make good money from his paintings, if he could afford to buy an apartment in a place like this. Mia decided to walk next to the houses, clean yards, spacious parking lots, sports fields. Behind the new buildings you could see old houses, by which you could study the history of the city. Stucco, patterned shutters, columns. Mia involuntarily admired the old buildings. Now here were located some organizations, and once upon a time in these houses lived merchants and craftsmen. Mia's attention was suddenly attracted by the archway leading to the inner courtyard. Interestingly, there the girl was ready to see some old monument or fountain. But Mia's attention was attracted by the walls of the arch itself. They were painted from bottom to top, and not just primitive drawings or graffiti, but images that were clearly from the hands of real artists. Beasts, fairy tale characters, heroes of famous movies and cartoons, wise sayings written in beautiful fonts. Mia looked at this chronicle in admiration. What an extraordinary place. Her eyes mottled with the abundance of drawings. She wanted to look at everything, absolutely everything, without missing a single detail. And then Mia saw herself again. A barefoot girl with long dark hair was dancing on the round yellow surface of the moon against the black space, beautiful and sad, and again the same leather bracelet on her wrist, her favorite. It was still on her now. The girl's breath caught. He had done this drawing. Jack. The guy lives somewhere nearby and probably drew it just recently. The paint was still bright, fresh. The girl couldn't help herself. Pulled an eyebrow pencil out of her bag and left a signature next to the painting. I've seen it. It's very beautiful. Only I'm not like that at all. Mia returned home in a strange mood. On the one hand, she was happy to find another message from the mysterious Jack and to see that she did indeed hold some place in his heart and thoughts on the other. It was even harder now. Because after what had happened, she didn't want to see William at all. A relationship with him now seemed even more wrong. Before going to bed, Mia tried to imagine what Jack looked like. After all, she might have even seen him at the club. This man. She meant something to him. If Jack drew her so often, Jack's mother died when he was very young. An illness took her life after giving birth to her only child. The boy was raised by his father, a sullen and busy man, and his grandmother, his father's mother. The child had never been denied anything since he was a child. His only parent Oliver was a successful businessman. The man always dreamed that his son, when he grew up, would continue his business. Oliver planned to leave his mini empire to his heir. But something went wrong. Jack didn't live up to his father's expectations. From an early age, he was indifferent to his business. Talking about purchases, profits, stocks, subsidiaries made the boy dreary. Oliver was angry, enrolled his son in financial literacy courses and economic schools. But Jack was always there, in the ranks of laggards. And the boy did not try to get into all these wisdoms. His favorite occupation was drawing. From an early age he drew on everything he could get his hands on. Paper, books, refrigerator doors, and of course wallpaper. 
At the same time, from under the hands of the kid came out not the usual for such age scribbles and quite good drawings. Then the boy had albums, as well as paints, pencils, and felt-tip pens. His drawings improved day by day. Everyone who saw them admired them and advised Oliver to send his son to art school. But he just waved them off. He considered drawing a bliss, dabbling in something frivolous. The man planned to develop his son in another direction. As a teenager, Jack could stay in his room 24 hours a day. In his sketchbooks appeared fantastic worlds of evil trolls, beautiful princesses, courageous heroes. Drawing, the guy forgot about everything and about lessons, and the need to go to school, and even about food. Drawing absorbed him completely. He did not need anything at such moments, nothing else interested the boy. And if it weren't for his grandmother almost forcibly tearing his grandson out of his familiar world, Jack wouldn't have left his room at all. But Lily was relentless. She made sure that her grandson did his homework, ate on time and attended all those sections and clubs that Oliver had chosen for him. Lily and her son were people practical, grasping, purposeful. Jack's creative nature was alien to them, and it was unclear what caused conflicts and frustrations. Jack's mother would have shared his hobbies. She was a very good artist herself. Oliver still kept his wife's drawings, which she sometimes gave him. They were pictures of songs that both spouses liked to draw. Jack loved to look at these drawings. To him, they were like a connection to the mom he never knew. It made him feel good to know that he looked like her. As the years went by, Oliver had all but given up on his failing son. Jack was not the kind of heir one might dream of. Weak, unsportsmanlike, withdrawn. He doesn't understand anything about his father's business and doesn't even want to understand anything. Always in the clouds, socializing with losers like himself. Doesn't think about the future. But Jack was no different from the sons of Oliver's acquaintances. Children of rich fathers rarely think about the future. They know everything's going to be all right. And Jack, against the wishes of his grandmother and father, continued to develop his talent. At the age of 13, he enrolled in art school. He constantly participated in some competitions and even won prizes. Oliver did not particularly delve into this hobby of his son. It was not interesting to him and seemed useless. Then Jack began to earn money. He painted quite professionally, and there were people willing to pay for his paintings, though small, but quite real money. Furthermore, Jack mastered computerized drawing. He got orders. Digital illustrations were in demand in publishing houses. They were used for website design, advertising, and so on. Oliver wondered how it was that his son had really learned to earn money by drawing. Really, what kind of income is there? So pennies for pocket money. But it was his own. After high school, Jack enrolled at the Art Institute. Although Oliver had already agreed with the right people, and his son was waiting for him at the prestigious Faculty of Economics. But the boy was adamant that he was not interested in economics. He's not going to become the head of his father's business. I have another way, Jack tried to convey to his parents. What way? Oliver didn't understand him. You can't make a lot of money with pictures. You're the one with the wind in your head now, and then you'll realize you were wrong. But it'll be too late. In the end, Jack did it his way. He had a strong character despite his fragile exterior. And then, then Jack left home altogether said he needed silence and solitude, it made it easier for him to create. His father tried to offer his stubborn son money, at least for the first time. His heart was troubled for Jack. Oliver thought his son was not adapted to life, but he refused. He said he'd been earning his own money for a long time. Well, an artist must be hungry. The boss is the boss. The landlady welcomed the young guest as her own. She was lonely. Her husband had died a long time ago. God didn't give them any children. So she took Jack as her favorite grandson. Pancakes in the morning, borscht, knitted socks. The old woman enveloped the boy in comfort and attention, like a warm blanket. She was pleased to take care of this talented young man. Jack gave Polly the same treatment, carried her heavy bags from the store, helped her move furniture, repaired the faucet. He had never felt so completely accepted. In the family to Jack were high demands, which the guy could not and did not want to meet. Here and there, he was loved and accepted as he was. Polly sincerely admired the work of the guy. She spent hours looking at his paintings, sometimes even gasped 
Not believing that such works could come out of the hands of such a young man, Jack painted several landscapes for Polly and even drew her portrait. The old lady hung it in the most prominent place on the living room wall. Or I created custom paintings and worked for the soul. He also developed in digital painting. This activity brought a good income. In parallel, Jack had time to study at the Art Institute. Here were given the basic fundamentals of painting, thanks to which the guy honed and perfected his talent. A capable artist very soon appeared like-minded people, the same enthusiastic painters of all ages and with a variety of experience. Jack communicated with talented people of his city, organized exhibitions together with them, took part in creative evenings, went on plein air. He had artist friends from other countries. Communication with them took place through social networks and messengers. Jack's works, to his own surprise, became increasingly popular. He received orders from all over the world. Now the guy had to refuse many. His work capacity was amazing. He could not sleep or eat for days, carried away by another picture. Polly often, almost forcefully, had to drag the inspirational young man in the kitchen so that he did not stretch his legs from hunger. But Jack's life was not only work and study. With new friends, he often walked around the city, went to nature, went to the movies. In general, did all the things that other people his age do. These meetings, they were a kind of reboot, a source of inspiration, adventures, new acquaintances, beautiful landscapes. All this gave rise in Jack's head terrific subjects, which the young man then transferred to the canvas. Jack had a fan, not just a fan of his work, but a fan of his own. Molly, a young waitress from the bar, a part-time student, skinny, with short brown curls and a scattering of cute freckles on her nose. Jack and his friends frequented the bar. If it was Molly's shift, she would rush to their table, leaving all the other customers behind. The girl only had eyes for Jack. She was frozen by the young man's intelligent dark eyes, in which some mysterious fire burned constantly. She liked everything about him, his appearance, his movements, the way he dressed, and most importantly, his hands, narrow palms, long aristocratic fingers. Probably, about so looked young Dorian Gray from the famous work of Oscar Wilde. The girl showed her affection for Jack with all her appearance. It was impossible not to notice it. Molly smiled at him, looked into his eyes and inadvertently tried to touch his hand. Anyone else would have lost his head. But Jack, to Molly's dismay, paid no attention to her. Back in high school, the boy had been in love with a classmate. They even had an affair right after graduation. Stormy, colorful, beautiful. Except it ended in a trivial way. One day, Jack accidentally saw her on the street. She was kissing a brutal, pumped-up guy. The girl did not think to be embarrassed. Noticing Jack, as if nothing had happened, she introduced him to her companion and told him that she was going to him because she had fallen in love and lost her head. She had said the same thing three months earlier to Jack. Friends immediately warned Jack that this girl was too superficial, impulsive, and infallible. The girl lived bright emotions for months of communication with Jack, sensations dulled. So she went out for a new dose of adrenaline. Since then, Jack went headlong into creativity and seemed to have stopped thinking about his personal life. All his time was taken up with painting. Until now. Until that amazing meeting in the most seemingly inappropriate place for such an event. So, Jack fully immersed himself in his work. The effect was corresponding to the guy got orders, money for his drawings and paintings. The demand grew. The young artist could even afford to buy an apartment on the waterfront, which surprised his father, who thought his son was not capable of such a thing. This neighborhood has always attracted Jack. Cozy, unusual, beautiful. And what were the views of the full-flowing river? A great source of inspiration for artists. Sometimes Jack would visit Polly. The guy was drawn to the warm, cozy atmosphere of her small apartment. The old lady always met him with a happy smile and treated him to delicious home-cooked meals. But with his father and his mother, his own grandmother, Jack communicated with them only sporadically. He felt like a stranger among them. This feeling had been with Jack since early childhood. His siblings didn't understand him and constantly wanted to mold him into something else. Feeling his father's disappointment was not easy. Fateful meeting so changed. Jack and his views on life occurred on a Saturday evening in February. One of the boy's buddies was having a birthday party. The birthday boy decided to celebrate in a nightclub. 
not the best choice in Jack's opinion. The guy preferred other places of Rest Rock Bar in the center of the city, where local musicians gathered, a cafeteria on the waterfront, a large apartment, the studio of one artist from their company. But Jubilee wanted something new. Of course, Jack had been to nightclubs before. Loud music, bright flashes of light, students in strange dances, people indifferent, blank faces, indifferent eyes, sometimes laughter, smiles, and always booze flowing down the river, beer, champagne, cocktails. Jack himself didn't drink such beverages. They made him dull his consciousness and gave him a headache. The guy preferred to stay sane at all times, and he'd seen what happened to creative people who got their inspiration from the bottle. Sad stories. Jack sat at a table that night, indifferent to what was going on. His buddies had gone to the dance floor. Jack wasn't in the mood. He was thinking about the subject of his next painting. Dark sky, moon, stars, a riverbank, sparkles on the surface of the water. And in the center of this landscape, there had to be something beautiful, something or someone, something equally mesmerizing, harmonizing to the concept. Jack couldn't decide if it could be a graceful animal, a beautiful tree, the right image of a man just wouldn't come up. And then a romantic composition came into play. Jack wasn't particularly fond of club music, but this one caught his ear. There was a tenderness in the melody, a romanticism, and all this was well combined with the bass, which added accents in the right places. Jack noticed that the heads of those present were turned upward, he followed the people's gazes and marveled. He saw the most beautiful girl in the world. No, the guy had met beautiful girls before. He'd had models pose for him. After all, the graceful Figora and cute-faced Jack was not surprised, but there was something particularly attractive about the girl dancing on the platform. Graceful movements, huge eyes. Even in the semi-darkness, Jack noticed how beautifully they shone, as if they were two diamonds. The girl was dressed in short shorts, high boots, and a shiny top. At the same time, she didn't look provocative. All her movements were strictly calibrated. She looked like a princess or a beautiful nymph dancing in the moonlight. Jack realized who he would place in the center of the lunar landscape. It would be her, the young dancer. She was admired by all. But it was Jack who looked at Mia most closely, and it was she. He tried to memorize every detail, the curve of her dark eyebrows, the proportions of her beautiful face, the shade of her long hair flowing down her graceful back and fragile shoulders. That evening, having hardly returned home, the boy immediately set to work. By morning, the sketch was ready. Jack admired his creation. Yes, indeed, everything turned out exactly as he wanted it to. A beautiful lunar landscape and she was a nymph, a princess, a graceful, delicate creature. Jack hadn't recognized himself since, all he could think about was the beautiful stranger from the club. The boy then went to Calypso, more than once admiring the performance of the beautiful stranger, the heroine of one of his best paintings. The canvas now adorned the wall of his room, but the boy had made many copies in all different sizes. Several of them had already been sold for more than a good price. Jack was drawn to this girl more and more, but she remained out of reach. True, the guy had accidentally learned her name, heard a friend address her once. Mia was a wonderful name. It suited the young, beautiful creature just fine. Jack realized he was in love. Probably for the first time in his life, his feelings for that girl were nothing compared to what he felt now. Jack wanted to hear her voice, to look into her eyes. He didn't know anything about this girl. But the guy had a good sense of people, and even from a great distance realized that he and Mia were made for each other, but how to get close to her. She's always up there high, on the platform, yes and. Jack realized he wouldn't dare approach her first. He'd never been much of a macho man, but he didn't usually have trouble talking to people. But here he realized that if he'd been near Mia, he wouldn't have been able to utter a word out of excitement. She remained out of his reach. Beautiful, graceful, ethereal. Distant and yet so close, so close, so close to him. Jack loved to visit Polly. He liked the quiet, peaceful atmosphere of her little apartment. Every time the old woman was genuinely happy to see the former guest and tried to treat him to something homemade and tasty. Pies, pancakes, and borscht. Jack ate it all with both cheeks under the satisfied gaze of Polly. The guy gave her his paintings. 
and even once he drew a portrait of Polly based on a photograph from his youth. She saw Jack's work and marveled every time. I can't believe a man can do that, she said, looking at his creations. That summer evening, Jack came to Polly's house again, bought her favorite candy at the supermarket and went to visit her. Sitting in the bright kitchen, Polly in front of a plate of flavored pancakes that had just been cooked especially for him. Jack listened to the old lady's stories about her life, had a fight with a neighbor, went to the Polly clinic, the usual things, and all of a sudden, oh, I had an accident the other day. I still can't get over it, Polly confessed. What's the matter? Jack was worried. So I'm walking home from the store tonight, and out of nowhere a black dog jumps out at me. It's huge, angry, growling, coming at me. I looked around and there's no one there, just like that. Well, that's it. I think I'm finished. It must be a rabid dog. Normal dogs don't attack people. The dog pushed the old woman against the wall of the house. Polly backed away. When she felt the cold concrete against her back, she realized everything. There was nowhere else to go. She could only wait for the inevitable. Polly's heart was beating in her chest like a trapped bird. And then the girl is young, beautiful, and very brave. A stick in her hands and at the dog. The dog smelled her strength, tucked his tail and ran away. My savior, my guardian angel must have sent her. There was no one else. Jack smiled. The world wasn't without good people. He'd realized that a long time ago. So I wanted to thank her, Polly continued. She didn't like it at first, but I told her I had a thing that looked like it was made for her. And what is it? Jack was interested. It's yours. I hope you're not offended. I gave her that princess dancing under the moon. Jack nodded. He understood what he meant. A copy of his most successful painting. The one of Mia. Of course I don't mind, the boy assured him. I gave it to you. You can do whatever you want with it. It's my pleasure, really. It's just that that girl, she looked just like the princess from the picture, with her eyebrows, ease, and hair. Just as thin and beautiful, did she? Jack was worried. Yeah, I thought there was no such thing. It's an amazing coincidence. When I got over the shock, I saw the resemblance right away. I thought it was amazing. And her? When she saw the painting, she was very surprised. She stared at it, couldn't believe it for a long time. And then she started asking me where I got the picture, what kind of man painted it, and all that. And you? I answered all her questions. I told her about you. It just so happened that we didn't talk about your creative psukhanim. I guess we were both confused. I because of the damn dog, and she because of the painting, the portrait of her mesmerized by it. Jack couldn't sleep for a long time that night, going over Paulia's story in his head. Had she? Had she really met Mia? She just happened to bump into each other on the street. And the painting, which Jack had been inspired to create by Mia, had fallen into her hands in this strange way. Or was it just a girl who looked a lot like her? No. Jack understood, sensed with some sixth sense that Mia had the painting. She knows now that she has a secret admirer. And of course, the girl guessed that the artist had captured her in a dance, which means he saw Mia at the club. Surely now the girl is thinking about him, wondering who he is, trying to imagine his appearance. Exciting, wonderful, amazing. Jack assumed that since fate had made such an interesting move, now something would shift in his relationship with Mia, but nothing had changed. He was still watching her from afar, from the dance floor. She would dance on the high platform and then disappear, always disappearing. Jack had tried to watch for her outside the club many times, but he'd never seen her leave. Maybe there was some other way out of the place, some secret door. Or maybe the employees were leaving through the office building adjacent to the club. Jack was disturbed by the growing sadness in Mia's eyes. He could see it even from a distance. Something was going on in the girl's life. Either she was facing a difficult choice or something bad had happened to her. Either way, she needed the support of a trustworthy man. Jack was ready to help her. In fact, he wanted to. If only he had the chance. It was a warm summer evening. The sun was beginning to sink, coloring the sky in matchless pastel tones of pink, purple, blue. Jack was working, painting another picture for a customer. The man decided to make a gift to his elderly mother to present her with a landscape depicting the place where her childhood passed. The guy liked this order. Jack worked with inspiration and pleasure. From time to time he would look out the window. The view of the waterfront always lifted his spirits. The vastness, 
the wide river, the smart people, a beautiful place. Today it was crowded. The motley crowd flowed down the street like a full flowing stream. Suddenly Jack saw her. He couldn't be mistaken, couldn't look at Mia because he had drawn her so many times, watched her movements so carefully. Among the crowd of people he noticed the girl who had become his muse, his inspiration, and his dream. She looked very different from her performances. Her hair was gathered in a high ponytail, on her feet were stomped sneakers, a light backpack on her shoulders. Mia was wearing jeans and a simple gray t-shirt, but Jack recognized her. Of course he did. What were the odds that Mia would be passing by his windows just as he took his eyes off the canvas? Minimal. There was no way to pass up a chance like that. Jack rushed to the window. Now he would open it and call out to Mia. What happens then? It doesn't matter. The main thing was to get her attention, to hold the girl, to ask her to wait for him. She'll probably be surprised, maybe even scared. But Jack will explain everything to her, and Mia will understand. Jack as an artist was a very sensitive man, and understood perfectly well that he and Mia were made for each other, as if they were halves of the same whole. The damn window wouldn't open, the handle was jammed. It had happened before. Jack tugged at it in a futile attempt to work the broken mechanism. It was no use. Meanwhile, Mia was getting farther and farther away. Judging by her trajectory, she was heading for the patio. That's where the windows from the other room looked out. Jack rushed into the bedroom, opened the window, leaned out through the waist-high window looking for the girl. She should be here any minute. But Mia didn't come into the yard. He caught a glimpse of her disappearing through an archway. The artist's arch. It was a special place. The walls of the arch were painted from the ground to the ceiling by artists. Local and visiting painters left their mark here, painting what they liked best. Animals, people, movie and cartoon characters, memorable places of the city, anything. The arch mesmerized, attracted, held. Mia would surely spend a lot of time there, as would everyone who found themselves under its arches. Jack would be there in time, in time to get to her. What luck. The young man's heart was pounding. Would he really look into the eyes of the one he had dreamed of for so long? In the archway were Jack's creations, including his drawing of her beautiful Mia. How could he not? Since the young man first saw the beauty, she often became the heroine of his paintings. On the wall of the arch, Jack depicted the surface of the moon and Mia dancing on it. Maybe the girl would even find her portrait. And if she didn't, Jack would show it to her. They were about to meet. Luck seemed to favor the young man as he sprinted out onto the landing. The elevator had just arrived on his floor. A neighbor stepped out and raised his eyebrows in surprise at the sight of the troubled young man. Jack's hands were smeared with paint, as was his long apron, which he had forgotten to take off in his haste. Yes, he must have been a sight to behold, but Jack didn't care about that right now. He was in a hurry to get to Mia. The guy jumped into the elevator car and pressed the first floor button with force. The doors closed. The elevator rushed down. Suddenly there was an abrupt stop. The car stopped between floors, froze. In desperation, Jack began to press all the buttons, but in vain. A moment later, the lights went out. The elevator was stuck. It had happened in their building before. But why now? Why was it happening now? Jack called dispatch. Fortunately, he had his cell phone in his apron pocket. Help arrived relatively quickly about 20 minutes later. That time seemed like an eternity to Jack. He wanted to smash through the walls of the elevator and rush to Mia. She was right there, only a hundred meters away. The utter helplessness of it all made him despair. But there was also hope. This could very well happen. Mia lingered in the archway, waiting for him. When Ilya was finally released, he immediately rushed outside. His path led him to the archway. Someone was there, someone was there for sure. The guy heard voices. Indeed, in the archway the guy found two guys and a girl looking around in surprise. Mia was not among them. Disappointment, sadness, pain. Jack was overwhelmed by a whole range of feelings. How could this be? The guy went to the wall where he'd drawn Mia dancing on the moon. And he saw, he saw the inscription that she had no doubt left behind. Mia wrote that she had seen his paintings and that she thought they were very beautiful. But the girl also informed the guy that she wasn't like that at all, not what he imagined her to be. Jack felt himself thrown into a fever. Mia had left him a message. 
She knew Jack would read it. Maybe. Maybe she'd come here again, or maybe she wouldn't. Either way, any opportunity to communicate with her should be taken. The boy pulled a black lead pencil out of his apron pocket and made a notation under the one Mia had left. He didn't even think about the content of the message. The right words were born in his head by themselves. You are the most beautiful girl on earth. The embankment under the old bridge. Mia will find that place. She will. And there and there Jack will leave another message for her. Without delaying the matter, the boy returned home, took paints, brushes, changed his clothes, and went to the embankment under the old bridge. It was a quiet, deserted place. It was here, on the concrete wall, that Jack would write a message for Mia. Or rather, he'd draw it. It's what he does best. All the more so because some unknown force was already pulling him by the hand to the wall, forcing him to create, to work, to draw. He drew the central town square, a fountain, pyramidal poplars, a tower with a clock on its face, the time six o'clock. Then Jack drew a bench exactly like the one that stood near the fountain in that very park. And on it, on this very bench, the artist drew a girl. She sat half turned toward the audience, head slightly down, cell phone in hand. It was Mia, dressed exactly as she was today. Jeans, sneakers, gray t-shirt. If she saw it, she would certainly understand. But for outsiders, the work will remain just a beautiful and realistic picture. Mia will understand. If she wants to, she'll come to the park at six o'clock at night. And he, Jack, would wait for her there every day from now on. Back home, Mia took a bath, warmed up dinner and turned on her favorite TV series. The events unfolding on the screen did not occupy the girl much. She thought about what she saw today, the same mysterious artist, Jack. He had drawn her again and again in the image of a beautiful girl. Not just a girl, almost a sky dweller. That must be how he sees her. And this, this is a big mistake. The guy is clearly in love with her and, like every lover, idealizes the girl. The artist sees her through a different set of eyes. It's a good thing they don't really know each other. Otherwise, this man would be disappointed. Apparently, he is still young and inexperienced, since he doesn't understand who she is. Her. It looks like she's about to become William's mistress. And Mia realizes it won't be for long. William will find someone younger, more interesting, but she's still willing to do it. Why? Well, I guess she wants to feel cherished for a while. And William, he's a man of the world. He makes you feel unique, special, one of a kind. So what if it's all just an illusion? It doesn't matter. The journey ahead is the one step that separates Mia from giving up on William. And she's ready to take it. She was ready. The girl had already made up her mind but then suddenly there was this picture in the archway. It was as if a mysterious unknown artist was trying to tell her that she was beautiful and worthy of true love. And it was at this turning point that Mia saw the image. Seeing herself in that image made her doubt again, doubt that she was doing the right thing. William is married. He already had an army of them like Mia. How many more were to come? Should I say no to William? But the tickets are already booked. The hotel's already booked. Maybe it's too late. I should have thought of that sooner. Mia decided that tomorrow night after the exam she would go to that archway again and look at her portrait. And there, on that wonderful spot, she would make her final decision. The next evening Mia stood in the arch again. It's a very unique place, even the atmosphere is special. And here's her portrait. But what is it? There's a new inscription underneath it. It must have been left there. He's the artist. Or was it? Maybe someone was just kidding. That's also possible. There's a lot of people here every day. Jack, if it was really him, asked Mia to go under the old bridge. It was already like a quest. Mia just couldn't help but go there. The girl, trying not to change from a quick step to a run, went to the old bridge. It was at the other end of the embankment. It was a long walk, and Mia couldn't wait to get there. Suddenly, there was a solution to all her problems, a way out of the difficult situation she had gotten herself into, even salvation. The passers-by looked at the pretty girl in a hurry. Mia realized that she looked a little strange, disheveled and worried. Her cheeks were burning, her face was hot, but her palms and feet, on the contrary, were very cold. And she was afraid, afraid that she wouldn't find anything under the bridge. Mia had too much hope for this place. Picture. 
barely under the bridge, Mia saw it immediately and exhaled with relief. That inscription. She was not a joke, not a hoax. She had indeed been left by the artist, and he had also painted a new picture for her. This time a big one, the whole wall. He must have finished it recently. The paint was still fresh. Mia already recognized Jack's hand. The young man worked in his own special way. Realistic images came out from under his brush, which seemed to emanate a glow. Amazing talent. This time Jack painted the central square. Mia recognized the fountain, the clock tower, the trees. How does this guy manage to achieve such realism? Mia could even see the glints of light on the black beady eyes of the sparrows scampering by the fountain. And of course Mia saw herself. She was wearing the same jeans and t-shirt as yesterday. So Jack had seen her? But why didn't he come over? Didn't dare. Poor guy thinks she's some kind of goddess, but she's just an ordinary, ordinary girl who's willing to be a rich man's mistress for the sake of a good life. It's going to be hard for her to accept William's game after all this. I wonder what Jack wanted to say with this painting. This time the guy didn't leave any signatures, but Mia realized that the plot was chosen for a reason. It contained some secret meaning. And then her gaze fell on the dial adorning the tower. Six o'clock, six p.m. by the look of it. Maybe, maybe Jack was asking her to be in the park at 6 p.m., but what day? Mia searched the painting with her eyes for any clue and found none. All she saw was the time and nothing else. The girl glanced at her watch. Half past six would get her to the square by the right hour. That's if she took her time. Or maybe give up on everything and go home. Time to pack. The flight's the day after tomorrow. Mia had never been abroad before. She's never even seen our sea. She's going to have a wonderful vacation at an expensive resort. William won't deny her anything. She'll feel like a real princess, if only for a while. But how to give up this fairy tale that appeared in her life recently and changed her so much? Mia realized she probably wouldn't find Jack in the park. Still, there was a chance, albeit a small one. And this guy, this young artist whom Mia had never seen in her life, she already cared about him. The girl wanted to know what he looked like, to hear his voice, to feel all the love he expressed for her through these paintings. Mia arrived at the square even before the appointed time. She couldn't walk slowly. Her feet carried her forward, and here was the bench from the painting. Mia sat down on it. There it was, the clock tower, five to six. There are people all around, but none of them fit the role of the artist in love. A woman with two toddlers, a man with a newspaper, Two old men playing chess on a bench across the street, a bunch of boys, selflessly splashing in the fountain, a full-figured red-headed girl with a book. Mia sighed heavily. Obviously no miracle was going to happen. That was fine. She'll sit here a little longer and then go home. She had a lot of things to do. Things to pack, William to call, and then. That's when she saw him. It was definitely him. A tall, slender young man walking straight to the bench from the fountain and smiling. He was looking right at her, keeping his eyes on the girl. The guy seemed a little embarrassed but tried to hide it. Jack, we meet at last, he said as he stepped in front of Mia. Nice voice, quiet and a little lulling. Hi. The girl couldn't tear her gaze away from his eyes, framed by long lashes. The guy was clearly overcoming the embarrassment, and it looked very nice. My name is Jack. I know, that's all I know about you. And the fact that you have an apartment on the waterfront, that old lady said. Looking into his eyes, Mia realized that she wasn't going anywhere with William. She would stay here with Jack, 